Hey, we're in a series called The Best Sex Ever. I was at a conference just a few weeks ago, and this minister and his wife have uh, been married for many years, and they were talking about love languages. And uh, his love language is touch. When she touches him, he feels loved. And, and her love language is gifts. When he buys her gifts, she feels loved and appreciated. And so, um, but they both have issues meeting each other's love language needs. And they finally worked out a system that worked for them. And quote, this is what they said. They said, and so we finally worked out a way. She, she said, I uh, buy my own gifts and he touches himself. And uh, it didn't come out at all the way she meant it. But what we figured out, men and women are different, you know? Um, in the area of sex, men and women don't think alike. They don't have the same drive for sex. Uh, Tommy Nelson is a preacher down in Texas. He said if men had the same sex drives that women did, uh, there would be a lot less kids running around. And if women had the same sex drive that men do, nothing else would ever get done. And so it's good that God made us the way that we are. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth because they were having issues in this area. He wrote to them about sex and marriage. And uh, we're going to look at a passage there first, but then we're going to read uh, parts from an Old Testament book, the Song of Solomon, that talks about uh, a couple and their dating and their marriage and uh, their life together. And so we're going to start, though, with 1 Corinthians 7. And so if you have a Bible, turn there. If you don't, there should be one of the chairs in front of you. It's page 809. Uh, 1 Corinthians is toward the end of the Bible, after the books of Acts, Romans, and in 1 Corinthians 7 is where I'm going to start reading today. Paul's writing to the church at Corinth, talking to them about sex and marriage, and he tells them this, starting in verse 3. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. Do not deprive each other, except by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So there's some fundamental things we need to get through first. Uh, first of all, it's, he says uh, the, the husband and wife, they need to fulfill their marital duty to each other. And this is one of the passages that guys like. They're like, hey, hon, did you read this? There we go. Come on. And guys, if that's the reasoning behind uh, what you want to do with her, good luck with that. All right? Uh, you're probably not going to get very far. The interesting thing here is, is the wife's body doesn't belong to her alone, but also to her husband. But also it switches around. The husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. You know, uh, we talked a little bit last week about the idea in Corinth um, the, the, it was a very sexually oriented society, and part of worship of, of some of the, the uh, gods out there involves sex. And so it's saying here, number one, uh, wives, you know, part of you belongs to your husband, but also husband, part of you belongs to your wife. That's the first time uh, that it really has been out there that women had rights. Uh, even in the marriage relationship, it was common for guys just to go do whatever they wanted and say, well, I still love you, honey. You're my wife. And then he did whatever he wanted. And so Paul puts men and women on equal footing. That's a pretty radical thing that's going on. Um, second of all, uh, guys like the first part, you know, hey, you know, it says right here, you know, we belong to each other. Don't deprive each other. But I've, I've and it's talking primarily about the, uh, the sexual relationship, but guys, do we deprive our wives? When you go and work all day long, you come home, and you expect her to have supper there ready, and then you sit on the couch for four, five, six hours at night watching TV, and then you go, okay, let's not deprive each other. <laughs> and she's like, well, what have you been doing? For the last four, five, six hours, you know, I haven't seen you all day. You've deprived me of yourself, and now you want to go there? All right, well, good luck. You know, that, <laughs> and we wonder why there's, there's so many issues there. When we get married, you know, our goal is to make the other person happy. That's what it should be when you stand up in front of people in a, in a wedding ceremony. You don't go, okay, well, I'm pledging all of myself to you, at least until I get bored, and then uh, we'll be done. That's not the kind of vows we make. The vows we make are, you know, I, I commit all of me to you. You are so special that all the people in this world mean nothing to me compared to you. And so I want to live my life committed to you, and I want you to live your life committed to me. We're in love. We want this to go forever. 
I mean, that's the kind of thing that we commit to. But as soon as we get married, something happens and the lazy genes kick in on, on the husbands and the wives, you know, and, and we stop pursuing each other. We stop chasing after each other. And so we let all these other things come in the way, whether it's kids or work or, or whatever it is. And we stop pursuing each other. The, the, the commitment we make is more about our responsibilities to each other. We like to stand up for our rights. You need to do this for me. I deserve this. You owe me. And we forget about the responsibilities and the way we're supposed to serve and love in the marriage relationship. I'm coming at this with the attitude of this, that if you're married or going to be married in the near future, that you want your marriage to go well, okay? And so the, the things we're talking about this morning are the ways to make your marriage better. And I'm assuming at some point that you're willing to do something about that. And if you're not, go ahead and take your nap or, you know, take off, whatever. I don't care. Okay, but that's kind of the assumption I've got going into this. Is that as a married couple or a soon-to-be married couple, whatever, that we are saying, what can I do for my spouse? And so there, there are two things uh, that we're going we're gonna to switch to the Old Testament book, the Song of Solomon. Um, two things that, that we're going to look at. First of all, in marriage, the women want to be pursued. Women want to be pursued. Sex for a woman begins in her mind. It begins with her thoughts and her feelings. And there are three areas of this, guys, that I'm going to, I'm going to talk about. And Because a lot of times we just don't get it. Okay? We don't understand all this stuff. And so hopefully I can help you out just a little bit in this area. Your wife wants to be pursued, first of all, by she wants you to know her and understand her and appreciate her for who she is. When you read through the King James Version of the Bible, back in the very first book, in the book of Genesis, it says that Adam knew his wife. It's a euphemism for had sex, but it just, it's a very interesting take on it that Adam knew his wife. He knew her. He understood her. That's what she wants, and that's, she wants you to know what she likes and what she doesn't like and why she likes or doesn't like certain things. So that's why we get in trouble sometimes when we give her a gift. We give her a gift sometimes, and she's like, oh, and she just starts crying. This is so wonderful. And you're like, dude, all right, I'm going to give her that gift again. I see the reaction you know, that she got there. But, but there are times that we give her gifts, and she's like, all right, thanks, and sets it aside. Because when you're getting her something, and it's something that you think is really cool, it doesn't matter if you think that it's really cool. You're getting her a gift, and so you need to get her something that she likes. And so you need to know and understand the things that she likes, things that she would want. And ladies, they help us out in this sometimes. When we're going through the store, you know, and, you, and you're shopping, and I know kind of how painful that can be at times, and if you're on your phone and texting or doing whatever, you're probably going to miss some hints. Because ladies like to drop hints about things that they like. When they're going through a store and they say, point at this thing and go, oh man, I really like that. I really love that. I bet that would look great on me. And you're like, uh-huh. Okay. Dude, you just missed out. She's telling you what she wants. She's telling you what you like. And the great thing about stores here, even if you get it wrong, you can return it. Okay? And so what I'm saying is, if you you got to pay attention to her, and she will tell you things that she likes, and she'll tell you things that she doesn't like. There are very few women alive who don't have an opinion about things, okay? And so if you actually listen to the words she says, you may catch on some of those things and say, huh, well, the last 16 times I did this for her, she didn't like it. I bet she will number 17, okay? Pay attention to what she's saying. No one understand her. No one understand what she likes. She's a human being, and just because she's your wife, she's still a person, okay? And so see, pay attention, look at the things she likes. Look at the things that, that are important to her. If she keeps commenting on something, it, it may not be just that she's bored and needs something to fill the conversation. Maybe she's trying to tell you, I like this. You can surprise me by getting me this. So first of all, women like to be known and understood and appreciated. For who they are. Second of all, they like communication. And when guys hear communication, I mean, we just put up the blinders right away. Uh, it, it's hard. It's hard for guys, especially because we don't understand all the times. Guys, l let me just give you a hint on listening to your wife, okay? If there's a screen on in the area and you need to listen to your wife, 
It's not gonna happen, okay? Because anytime there's a screen on, I don't care if it's underwater basket weaving, your eyes are drawn to that screen. And so if you go to a restaurant for a date with her, and you're like, okay, how can I position so I can see the game and be here with my wife? Dude, you lost it already. Because there ain't no way that you're going to pay attention. You're going to start giving her, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, uh-huh. And you're not going to have any idea what she said. So if you're going to places and you're trying to have a conversation with your wife at some point, you need to put your back to whatever TV thing is. If you're at home trying to have a conversation, coolest thing ever, coolest invention ever, DVR with pause on the TV. So if she's trying to talk to you, you can hit pause. Guess what? You're not going to miss anything and you get to pay attention to her. Hitting pause and pointing at her, not a good thing, okay? Because when she comes out of pause mode, she's coming at you, all right? So just trying to help. But when, when women, when they're having conversation, there's, there's a part that we don't get. There's a part that we don't understand because they tell us, they come out and, and they're, they're hopping up and down mad and they're throwing things and we look at them and we're like, what's going on? And you're like, they like tell us this, this, this problem that's just happened and our reaction is, okay, well, let me fix the problem, right? Because that'll solve the thing. And as guys, we're like, okay, there we go. But as guys, have you ever noticed that when she comes out and she's hopping up and down mad and, and you fix the problem, it doesn't change anything? Do you know why that is? I just figured out this recently. I've only been married 18 years, and so I'm a little behind the curve. Here's the deal. When she comes out, she's hopping down mad, okay? Um, here's the deal. And she wants you to understand her feelings in the situation, okay? When you, she's coming out and she's like that, and you go to her and say, are you upset? <laughs> yeah, I'm upset. And then she tells you what's going on. She doesn't want you to fix it. She wants you to understand her emotions, understand what she is feeling so that you can cooperate in this together. When you start popping out solutions, guess what? Your solutions are not near as good as hers. She can fix the things. That's, she doesn't need help fixing the thing. She's got all this emotions in her. It's got to vent out here somewhere. And you're the one that's supposed to be cooperating with her. And so she says, I need you to work with me on this, and you think you need to fix it. No, you need to understand what she's feeling. Say those words back to her. You seem upset. Is it because so-and-so did this? Yeah. Well, I can see how frustrating that would be. Now she feels like you're on the same team together. Guys, we're videotaping this sermon, so you can go back and watch this, okay? Because you're not going to get that the first time. Okay? It's not going to happen. So go back, go to the church's website, go to media, go to video sermons, watch that statement a few times. When she has an issue, she wants you to understand her feelings and say, okay, yeah, I can see why that would make you happy or why that would make you sad or why you want to shoot somebody. Don't shoot me, okay? I'm not the one. That's what she's looking for. As you read through the Song of Solomon, when this couple is dating, Solomon notices this in uh, chapter 1, verse 5. Here's what she says about herself. Um, they're still in a dating relationship. Dark am I yet lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem. Dark like the tents of Kedar, like the tent curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I'm dark, because I'm darkened by the sun. My mother's sons were angry with me and made me take care of the vineyards. My own vineyard I have neglected. Okay, understand back in Solomon's day, uh, the men worked out in the fields and the women stayed kind of by the tents for the most part. And so uh, when she is out in the sun and getting really dark and tan, that's not a good look, okay? The good look was being white and, and pale, okay? And so, but something happened, uh, and her brothers, she went out and worked in the vineyards also, and so she got really dark and tan, okay? And for, that was not a positive look. And so she's out there going, man, you know, don't look at me, you know, don't look, I... Don't judge me just because I have, I'm, I'm dark looking, okay? Solomon, in verse 9, says this. I liken you, my darling, to a mare harnessed to one of the chariots of Pharaoh. Your cheeks are beautiful with earrings, your neck with strings of jewels. Now, you may not understand the Hebrew poetry, and I get that, all right? Okay? But what he's saying is this. You're gorgeous. You're beautiful. I mean, her, her thought is, man, I... I am having a bad hair day. I'm having a bad skin month. And I just, just don't look at me. And Solomon says, are you kidding me? You're gorgeous. 
how, how, how can you not see how beautiful you are? You are, and, and names off these ways that she's beautiful. You know, he understands what she's feeling. And he doesn't say, okay, well, let's just set you inside for a couple weeks until the tan wears off. Okay? <laughs> So I understand that you feel, but, but in my eyes, you are a gorgeous woman. Women want to be pursued, and sex for a woman starts in her mind. It, it starts with being known and understood by her husband. It, it starts with communicating and listening to her feelings and, and sympathizing with those so that she knows that you're on the same page. That connects her to you. And the third thing is, she needs you to see her beauty. She needs you to see her beauty. Because here's the deal, especially in our society today, I mean, you got the, the models who <laughs> have all kinds of work done on them, <laughs> and they do all kinds of work to look the way that they do, and then beyond that, they're airbrushed into all kinds of things, and, and I'll tell you what, women look at that, and, they, and they're like, I don't think I can measure up to that. I don't think I can meet those things, and, and they look at themselves, and here's what all women do. They look at themselves, and they see the worst part of themselves. And they need a man in their life who's going to say, wait, let me tell you the, the good things about yourselves. And guys, when you tell your wife how beautiful she is, I mean, she needs to hear that. She needs to know that you see those things. Solomon, on his wedding day, um, it, it tells a story, basically. Their wedding night, he is undressing her, and he's complimenting her. Uh, chapter 3, uh, verse 11, uh, at the end of that, on the day of his wedding, the day his heart rejoiced, here's what happened. He's undressing her and complimenting her. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes behind your veil are doves. They're, they're peaceful. Your, your hair is like a flock of goats descending from Mount Gilead. Now, I don't know, ladies, if you want your hair compared to a flock of goats, but, but there it is. <laughs> Hebrew poetry, halfway across the world thousands of years ago. I don't understand poetry from today, okay? But take it from me. Uh, we can go through and, and really research and, and, and see that he's complimenting her. He's, he's complimenting her beauty as we go through here. Uh, your teeth are just like a flock of sheep just shorn, coming up from the washing. Each has its twin, not one of them is alone. She's got a nice smile, okay? And when you look back at days when there was, wasn't dentistry to have, <laughs> she doesn't have teeth going everywhere, okay? Um, she's got a nice smile. Um, your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like halves of a pomegranate. Your head is fruity. Um, I'm just kidding. His, his meaning is obviously much better. Um, your neck is like the Tower of David built with elegance. On it hang a thousand shields. All them shields of warriors. Probably was wearing her necklace with, a, with her dowry there. Uh, your two breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse among the lilies. And as it goes on through the rest of chapter 4, it talks about the wedding night and the consummation of their, of their marriage. And Solomon sees his bride, and he calls her out in her beauty. He sees the things that are amazing, and he's not afraid to tell her how beautiful she is. I think that's the issue so many times. Guys, if you understood how often your wife compared herself to that fake model that we see and found herself wanting. Ladies, if you knew how beautiful your men uh, thought that you were, and you don't know a lot of times because we forget to say it. And so uh, understand that. And so guys, women want to be pursued. It starts in their mind with knowing that they're appreciated, love for who they are, that you communicate and you connect to her with her feelings. But she also needs to know that, that, that you see her beauty and, and you're willing to say those things out loud. And there are so many guys that, that look at something like this and they're like, well, Brian, I mean, that's, that's a lot of work. <laughs> and I don't get all this stuff. And I understand that. I understand that you may not understand all these things, but here's the deal. At some point, you were doing these things. At some point, you were pursuing her and, and you were making her feel these ways. And I don't know if you realize it or not, but, but you caught her, okay? And if you look at yourself in the mirror, why would she choose you, okay? I mean, seriously, you know what I'm saying, guys, okay? It's because she chose you because you were doing these things. And so you've done it in the past. You need to keep doing that in the future. 
Your wife needs to feel these ways. She needs to think these ways. And she's much more open to sex when these things are happening. Okay? Women want to be pursued. In the same way, men. Men want to be pursued. Men want to be wanted as well. Okay? It just looks different than what it looks for women. For women, uh, or for men, um, one of the biggest things, ladies, is, is that you respect your husband. You respect him. And, and, and we have a, a book, uh, a, a DVD series uh, called Love and Respect because uh, everywhere in the world it says, um, love your spouse, love your spouse. And nowhere in the Bible does it say, wives, love your husbands. Okay? It says, wives, respect your husbands. You look up to him. You brag on him. You're proud of him. That's what he needs from you. You know, everywhere we hear about men are supposed to have unconditional love for their, for their wives, as well as they should. But the Bible says you need to have unconditional respect for your husband. That's what he needs for you, because we're different. And so you look up to him, you brag on him, you, you praise him, you, you catch him doing something good, and you let him know. Okay, ladies, you do a great job of catching us doing all the bad stuff. Okay? And you're not afraid to verbalize those things, right? But when you catch him doing the good stuff and you praise him, say, man, you're, you're a good man. I, 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 I appreciate that so much about you. That makes a big deal. That keeps your man emotionally attached to you. Listen to what uh, this bride does. Listen to what she says about her husband. Uh, in uh, Song of Solomon 5, my lover is radiant and, and ruddy, outstanding among 10,000. Out of all those guys out there, this guy's mine. He is outstanding. I mean, tell your husband he's outstanding. See if he just says, oh, thanks. Yeah. Or see if it doesn't perk him up a little bit. His head is pure as gold. His hair is wavy and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves by the water streams, washed in milk, mounted like jewels. His eyes are clear. He's not drunk and, you know, he's sober. Um, his cheeks are like beds of uh, spice, yielding perfume. His lips are like lilies dripping with myrrh. He says good things. Uh, his arms are rods of gold set with chrysolite. You know, his arms are strong. Now, I don't care how strong your, your man is, okay? If he can only bench press 45 pounds, he still wants to be strong in your eyes. You don't believe me. Next time you get a chance, grab your man's bicep, see if he doesn't flex. You think I'm kidding. I, I don't know if it's impossible for a guy not to flex when a woman grabs his bicep. His body is like polished ivory decorated with sapphires. And you guys are like, well, it may have looked like that at one time. Um, but it's about a strength of character in the person. Uh, his legs are pillars of marble set on bases of pure gold. He wants to be a strong man for you. He wants to be your knight in shining armor. He wants to protect you. He wants to look out for you. He wants to stand firm and solid. He wants to appear that way to you. No guy wants to say, well, go find someone else to take care of my wife. He wants to do that himself. He wants to appear not just strong of body, but he wants to appear strong of character for you that he can stand. His mouth is sweetness itself. He's altogether lovely. This is my lover. This is my friend, O oh daughters of Jerusalem. Not only is she saying these things out loud, she's saying it to the people around her. She's bragging on her husband to everybody that's there. Ladies, you want your husband to be connected to you emotionally, you start doing those type of things. Because you don't want to be a sex object to him. He doesn't want to be a paycheck to you. And unfortunately, that's how it comes across a lot of times. Man, one of my best friends back in Ohio... I, he, they were married. He's a construction worker trying to provide more for his family. So he took a lot of side jobs that, that kept him busy in the evenings, got done with a big project and uh, told his wife, Hey, I need to take the next four or six months off. I need a break because I've just been working crazy at work and doing all these side things. I need a break from this. And so she, um, went and found a friend of a friend who needed a project that needed to be done and said that her husband would do it. And he said, that's it. And for him, that was the final straw. In general, was that a big deal? No, but it, it was the final straw for him because she saw him as a paycheck. She wasn't listening. She wasn't paying attention to what he wanted, what he needed. And so it's done. 
I'll tell you what, it, it's a hard thing because they're friends. But at some point, he felt like he was a paycheck and she wasn't paying attention to who he was. And so your husband needs to know that you respect him, that you look up to him, and he needs to hear just as much as you need to hear how beautiful you are. Second thing um, that men want to be pursued is that uh, men want to have sex. Yeah. Emotionally, this is how he connects to you. He connects to you emotionally during sex. When he doesn't have sex with you, he feels rejected, he feels depressed, and he gets angry. Not having sex with your husband would be the same thing as him stopping talking to you. That's how big a need it is. Ladies, if you can imagine your husband just said, okay, we're done having conversations, I'm done talking to you. That's how it feels when you don't have sex with him. Uh, there's a book by Shanti Feldham. It's, it's called For Women Only, What You Need to Know About the Inner Lives of Men. They did a professional survey and said, uh, ask men, how important is it you for you to feel sexually wanted and desired by your wife? 97% of guys said it's very or somewhat important for me to want to be sexually wanted and desired by my wife. So pretty much across the board, guys want to be sexually desired by their wives. It makes him feel loved. It gives him confidence. And the Bible gives us some hints, ladies. Great sex to a man is when you're responsive, when you're engaged in the sex life, okay? When you're not just passive. In, for this couple, they've been married for a long time. In the song, by the time we get to chapter 7, they've been married a long time. And so this is what happens in uh, chapter 7, verse 10. She says, I belong to my lover and his desire is for me. Come, my lover, let us go to the countryside. Let us spend the night in the villages. Let us go early to the vineyards to see if the vines have budded, if their blossoms have opened, and if the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. What'd she do? She planned a romantic getaway. They've been married a long time. And she's like, hey, just me and you. Kids will stay at home. We're going to go. We're going to have some time together. When you initiate, or, or at least are not passive in the bedroom, it draws him to you. It connects him to you emotionally. Same book. Uh, did another survey, uh, another question on the survey, and said this. If your wife offers you all the sex that you want, but does it reluctantly or to accommodate you, will you be sexually satisfied? If your wife says, all the sex you want, okay, uh, every single day, multiple times a day, as much as you want, but she does it reluctantly or just to accommodate you, will you be sexually satisfied as a man? 74% of guys said no. No. Because they want their wife to be actively involved. You know, that's a part of how they feel desired and loved by their wives. That's how men are being pursued. Men and women are different. The place we started the conversation was this, is that uh, a husband has a, a marital duty to his wife and a wife has a marital duty to her husband. And I think that we want to get beyond the duties and get into the, the want-tos and the passion of our relationship. And we had that for a while when we were pursuing each other, but we get lazy and we stop pursuing each other. And I don't know, you, you probably need to go home and, and, and have some conversations. Have some conversations. And I would strongly encourage you, uh, in the next couple of days, this video will be up online. And so when it is, turn it back on, go through it, watch it, and, and, and hit pause. And when you get to parts that, that you need to have some conversations with, say, okay, okay, stop, 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 stop. Is this true about you? And your spouse says, oh, yeah, so true. Okay? There may be some things that I set up here that, that may not apply across the board. And so you say, okay, does this apply to you? And you ask your spouse that, and they're like, well, no, not exactly that, but this. And to give you an opportunity to get and have some questions, some conversations and talk about these things. Because if you don't talk about these things, how can you get any better at it? How can you meet each other's needs? Your goal in marriage is to say, I'm going to please my spouse. I'm going to take care of my spouse. I'm going to make my spouse happy. Because so many times when you concentrate on making your spouse happy, guess what? Most of the time, they take care of your needs. 
It's a really cool cycle when that happens. All right? So go watch the video and uh, see if you can get even further in depth with this. But I know that there are some people here that, that when it comes to sex, you've got some history and some past. And we're going to deal with it in detail kind of next week. But for this week, I, a lot of times I think there's a lot of guilt and shame um, with stuff in our past. I just want to tell you the story from the Bible about Jesus. He was traveling one time and he stopped to, to get a drink at a well. And there's this woman that came and she was coming to get water and he, Jesus starts to talk to her and wants to talk to her about spiritual things, but she keeps talking about what's going on right now. And so finally he says, why don't you go get your husband and we'll have a, a big conversation. And she says, uh, I'm not married. And Jesus says, you're right. You've been married five times and you're living with a guy now. That's a conversation starter, isn't it? <laughs> Jesus says, hey, I know your past. I know who you are. I know, I know all this stuff that's going on. But guess what? I'm here to share with you about this God in heaven that loves you. Jesus said, I'm God in the flesh. I'm the son of God in the flesh. And I want you to know that God loves you. He knows what you've done in the past. He knows what's happened to you. He knows the choices you've made. And God still loves you anyway. God wants to work in you and make changes inside of you. And God wants to work through you so that you can, uh, you can help other people. And here's what happened to this lady. She understood the conversation Jesus was having with her, and then she started to believe in him. And so she went back to the village and started sharing with all these people, you have got to see this guy. He knew all about my past. He knew all, knows, knows all kinds of things about me, and he's still talking to me about God. And so for the next two days, Jesus gets to talk to all the people in that village about God. What I'm saying is this. I, I don't care what your past is, and I... It doesn't matter because God can do amazing things to help you become a new person created in Christ Jesus. The old is gone, the new has come. And he can do all kinds of amazing things inside of you. And he can do amazing things through you to affect other people. That's the God that we worship. Let's pray.